To understand the conflicts of Dune, you must know about the field process shield, which slows the rapid thrust of any solid object. Know about the feudal society which has grown up in these times, and about the harsh training for the aristocracy. You meet Paul Atreides here at age 15 when he enters a training session with one of his teachers, Gurney Halleck. They are in the family castle on Caladan. Paul lifted the companion rapier, bent it in his hands, stood in the agil, one foot forward. He let his manner go solemn in a comic imitation of Dr. Yue. What a dolt my father sends me for weaponry, Paul intoned. This doltish gurney Halleck has forgotten the first lesson for a fighting man, armed and shielded. Paul snapped the force button at his waist, felt the crinkled skin tingling of the defensive field at his forehead and down his back, heard external sounds take on the characteristic shield-filtered flatness. In shield fighting, one moves fast on defense, slow on attack, Paul said. Attack has the sole purpose of tricking the opponent into a misstep, setting him up for the attack sinister. The shield turns the fast blow, admits the slow kinjal. Paul snapped up the rapier, fainted fast, and whipped it back for a slow thrust, timed to enter a shield's mindless defenses. Halleck watched the action, turned at the last minute to let the blunted blade pass his chest. Speed excellent, he said, but you were wide open for an underhanded counter with a slip tip. Paul stepped back, chagrined. I should whap your backside for such carelessness, Halleck said. He lifted a naked kinjal from the table and held it up. This, in the hand of an enemy, can let out your life's blood. You're an apt pupil, none better. But I've warned you that not even in play do you let a man inside your guard with death in his hand. I guess I'm not in the mood for it today, Paul said. Mood? Halleck's voice betrayed his outrage even through the shield's filtering. What has mood to do with it? You fight when the necessity arises, no matter the mood. Mood's a thing for cattle, or making love, or playing the balisette. It's not for fighting. I'm sorry, Gurney. You're not sorry enough. Halleck activated his own shield, crouched with Kinjal outthrust in left hand, the rapier poised high in his right. Now I say guard yourself for true. He leaped high to one side, then forward, pressing a furious attack. Paul fell back, parrying. He felt the field crackling as shield edges touched and repelled each other, sensed the electric tingling of the contact along his skin. What's gotten into Gurney, he asked himself. He's not faking this. Paul moved his left hand, dropped his bodkin into his palm from its wrist sheath. You see a need for an extra blade, eh? Halleck grunted. Is this betrayal, Paul wondered? Surely not Gurney. Around the room they fought, thrust and parry, faint and counterfeint. The air within their shield bubbles grew stale from the demands on it that the slow interchange along barrier edges could not replenish. With each new shield contact, the smell of ozone grew stronger. Paul continued to back, but now he directed his retreat toward the exercise table. If I can turn him beside the table, I'll show him a trick, Paul thought. One more step, Gurney. Halleck took the step. Paul directed a parry downward, turned, saw Halleck's rapier catch against the table's edge. Paul flung himself aside, thrust high with rapier, and came in across Halleck's neckline with the bodkin. He stopped the blade an inch from the jugular. Is this what you seek? Paul whispered. Look down, lad, Gurney panted. Paul obeyed, saw Halleck's kinjal thrust under the table's edge, the tip almost touching Paul's groin. We'd have joined each other in death, Halleck said, but I'll admit you fought some better when pressed to it. You seem to get the mood, and he grinned wolfishly, the ink vine scar rippling along his jaw. The way you came at me, Paul said, would you really have drawn my blood? Halleck withdrew the kinjal straightened. If you'd fought one whit beneath your abilities, I'd have scratched you a good one, a scar you'd remember. I'll not have my favorite pupil... Fall to the first Harkonnen tramp who happens along. No Harkonnen tramp gets Paul Atreides, but on Dune they do kill all but Paul and his mother, the Lady Jessica. The two of them flee to the desert, where they seek refuge with Liet Kynes, the planetologist. They are talking to Kynes when the door behind Paul slammed open. He whirled to see reeling violence, shouting the clash of steel, wax image faces grimacing in the passage. 
With his mother beside him, Paul leaped for the door, seeing Idaho blocking the passage, his blood-pitted eyes there visible through a shield blur, claw hands beyond him, arcs of steel chopping futilely at the shield. There was the orange fire mouth of a stunner repelled by the shield. Idaho's blades were through it all, flick-flicking, red dripping from them. Then Kynes was beside Paul, and they threw their weight against the door. Paul had one last glimpse of Idaho standing against a swarm of Harkonnen uniforms, his jerking controlled staggers, the black goat hair with a red blossom of death in it. Then the door was closed, and there came a snick as Kynes threw the bolts. You've a way out of here, Paul said. Shall we use it? Kynes took a deep breath, said, This door should hold for at least twenty minutes against all but a lice gun. They'll not use a lace gun for fear we've shields on this side, Paul said. Those were Sardaukar in Harkonnen uniforms, Jessica whispered. They could hear pounding on the door now, rhythmic blows. Kynes indicated the cabinets against the right-hand wall, said, This way. He crossed to the first cabinet, opened a drawer, manipulated a handle within it. The entire wall of cabinets swung open to expose the black mouth of a tunnel. This door also is plasteel, Kynes said. You were well prepared, Jessica said. We lived under the Harkonnens for eighty years, Kynes said. He herded them into the darkness, closed the door. In the sudden blackness, Jessica saw a luminous arrow on the floor ahead of her. Kynes' voice came from behind them. We'll separate here. This wall is tougher. It'll stand for at least an hour. Follow the arrows like that one on the floor. They'll be extinguished by your passage. They lead through a maze to another exit where I've secreted a thopter. There's a storm across the desert tonight. Your only hope is to run for that storm, dive into the top of it, ride with it. My people have done this in stealing thopters. If you stay high in the storm, you'll survive. What of you, Paul asked. I'll try to escape another way if I'm captured. Well, I'm still Imperial Planetologist. I can say I was your captive. Running like cowards, Paul thought. But how else can I live to avenge my father? He turned to face the door. Jessica heard him move, said, Duncan's dead, Paul. You saw the wound. You can do nothing for him. I'll take full payment for them all one day, Paul said. Not unless you hurry now, Kynes said. Paul felt the man's hand on his shoulder. Where will we meet, Kynes? Paul asked. I'll send Fremen searching for you. The storm's path is known. Hurry now, and the great mother give you speed and luck. Paul and Jessica are marooned in the desert, where they are picked up by a wandering band of Fremen led by the Naib Stilgar. The Naib sees in Jessica the Sayadina of legend, and he suspects Paul may be the Lisan al-Gaib of prophecy, come to lead the Fremen to freedom. In Stilgar's troop are his niece, Cheney, and an older man, Jamis, who challenges Paul to combat as proof of the myth's reality. A ring formed within the troop. More glow globes were brought. Jameis stepped into the ring, slipped out of his robe, and tossed it to someone in the crowd. He stood there in a cloudy gray slickness of still suit that was patched and marked by tucks and gathers. For a moment he bent with his mouth to his shoulder, drinking from a catch pocket tube. Presently he straightened, peeled off, and detached the suit, handed it carefully into the crowd. He stood waiting, clad in loincloth and some tight fabric over his feet, a criss knife in his right hand. Jessica saw the girl child Cheney helping Paul, saw her press a criss knife handle into his palm, saw him heft it, testing the weight and balance. And it came to Jessica that Paul had been trained in prana and bindu, the nerve and the fiber, that he had been taught fighting in a deadly school, his teachers men like Duncan Idaho and Gurney Halleck, men who were legends in their own lifetimes. The boy knew the devious ways of the Bene Gesserit, and he looked supple and confident, but he's only fifteen, she thought, and he has no shield. I must stop this. Somehow there must be a way to... She looked up, saw Stilgar watching her. You cannot stop it, he said. You must not speak. She put a hand over her mouth, thinking, I've planted fear in Jameis's mind. I'll slow him some. Perhaps... If I could only pray, truly pray. Paul stood alone now, just into the ring, clad in the fighting trunks he'd worn under his still suit. He held a criss knife in his right hand. His feet were bare against the sand-gritted rock. Idaho had warned him time and again, When in doubt of your surface, bare feet are best. 
and there were Cheney's words of instruction still in the front of his consciousness. Jameis turns to the right with his knife after a parry. It's a habit in him we've all seen, and he'll aim for the eyes to catch a blink in which to slash you, and he can fight either hand, look out for a knife shift. But strongest in Paul, so that he felt it with his entire body, was training and the instinctual reaction mechanism that had been hammered into him day after day, hour after hour, on the practice floor. Gurney Halleck's words were there to remember. The good knife fighter thinks on point and blade and shearing guard simultaneously. The point can also cut, the blade can also stab, the shearing guard can also trap your opponent's blade. Paul glanced at the Chris knife. There was no shearing guard, only the slim round ring of the handle with its raised lips to protect the hand. And even so, he realized that he did not know the breaking tension of this blade, did not even know if it could be broken. Jameis began sidling to the right along the edge of the ring opposite Paul. Paul crouched, realizing then that he had no shield, but was trained to fighting with its subtle field around him, trained to react on defense with utmost speed, while his attack would be timed to the controlled slowness necessary for penetrating the enemy's shield. In spite of constant warning from his trainers not to depend on the shield's mindless blunting of attack speed, he knew that shield awareness was part of him. Jameis called out in ritual challenge, May thy knife chip and shatter! This knife will break then, Paul thought. He cautioned himself that Jameis also was without shield, but the man wasn't trained to its use, had no shield fighter inhibitions. Paul stared across the ring at Jameis. The man's body looked like knotted whipcord on a dried skeleton. His Chris knife shone milky yellow in the light of the glow globes. Fear coursed through Paul. He felt suddenly alone and naked, standing in dull yellow light within this ring of people. Prescience had fed his knowledge with countless experiences, hinted at the strongest currents of the future and the strings of decision that guided them, but this was the real now. This was death, hanging on an infinite number of minuscule mischances. Anything could tip the future here, he realized. Someone coughing in the troop of watchers, a distraction, a variation in a glow globe's brilliance, a deceptive shadow. I'm afraid, Paul told himself, and he circled warily opposite Jameis, repeating silently to himself the Bene Gesserit litany against fear. Fear is the mind killer. It was a cool bath washing over him. He felt muscles untie themselves, become poised and ready. I'll sheath my knife in your blood, Jameis snarled, and in the middle of the last word he pounced. Jessica saw the motion, stifled an outcry. Where the man struck... There was only empty air, and Paul stood now behind Jameis, with a clear shot at the exposed back. Now, Paul, now, Jessica screamed it in her mind. Paul's motion was slowly timed, beautifully fluid, but so slow it gave Jameis the margin to twist away, backing and turning to the right. Paul withdrew, crouching low. First you must find my blood, he said. Jessica recognized the shield fighter timing in her son, and it came over her what a two-edged thing that was. The boy's reactions were those of youth and trained to a peak these people had never seen. But the attack was trained, too, and conditioned by the necessities of penetrating a shield barrier. A shield would repel too fast a blow, admit only the slowly deceptive counter. It needed control and trickery to get through a shield. Does Paul see it, she asked herself. He must. Again, Jameis attacked, ink dark eyes glaring, his body a yellow blur against the glow globes, and again Paul slipped away to return too slowly on the attack, and again, and again. Each time Paul's counterblow came an instant late, and Jessica saw a thing she hoped Jameis did not see. Paul's defensive reactions were blindingly fast, but they moved each time at the precisely correct angle they would take if a shield were helping deflect part of Jameis's blow. "'Is your son playing with that poor fool?' Stilgar asked. He waved her to silence before she could respond. "'Sorry, you must remain silent.' Now the two figures on the rock floor circled each other, Jameis with knife hand held far forward and tipped up slightly. Paul crouched with knife held low. 
Again Jameis pounced, and this time he twisted to the right where Paul had been dodging. Instead of faking back and out, Paul met the man's knife hand on the point of his own blade. Then the boy was gone, twisting away to the left and thankful for Cheney's warning. Jameis backed into the center of the circle, rubbing his knife hand. Blood dripped from the injury for a moment, stopped. His eyes were wide and staring, two blue-black holes, studying Paul with a new wariness in the dull light of the glow-globes. Ah, that one hurt, Stilgar murmured. Paul crouched at the ready, and as he had been trained to do after first blood, called out, Do you yield? Ha! Jameis cried. An angry murmur arose from the troop. Hold! Stilgar called out. The lad doesn't know our rule. Then to Paul. There can be no yielding in the Tahadi challenge. Death is the test of it. Jessica saw Paul swallow hard, and she thought, He's never killed a man like this in the hot blood of a knife fight. Can he do it? Paul circled slowly right, forced by Jameis's movement. The prescient knowledge of the time-boiling variables in this cave came back to plague him now. His new understanding told him there were too many swiftly compressed decisions in this fight for any clear channel ahead to show itself. Variable piled on variable. That was why this cave lay as a blurred nexus in his path. It was like a gigantic rock in the flood, creating maelstroms in the current around it. Have an end to it, lad, Stilgar muttered. Don't play with him. Paul crept farther into the ring, relying on his own edge and speed. Jameis backed, now that the realization swept over him, that this was no soft outworlder in the Tahadi ring, easy prey for a Fremen Chris knife. Jessica saw the shadow of desperation in the man's face. Now is when he's most dangerous, she thought. Now he's desperate and can do anything. He sees that this is not like a child of his own people, but a fighting machine born and trained to it from infancy. Now the fear I planted in him has come to bloom. And she found in herself a sense of pity for Jameis, an emotion tempered by awareness of the immediate peril to her son, Jameis could do anything, any unpredictable thing, she told herself. She wondered then if Paul had glimpsed this future, if he were reliving this experience. Paul pressed the fight now, circling but not attacking. He had seen the fear in his opponent. Memory of Duncan Idaho's voice flowed through Paul's awareness. When your opponent fears you, then's the moment when you give the fear its own reign. Give it the time to work on him. Let it become terror. The terrified man fights himself. Eventually he attacks in desperation. That is the most dangerous moment, but the terrified man can be trusted usually to make a fatal mistake. You are being trained here to detect these mistakes and use them. The crowd in the cavern began to mutter. They think Paul's toying with Jameis, Jessica thought. They think Paul's being needlessly cruel. But she sensed also the undercurrent of crowd excitement, their enjoyment of the spectacle, and she could see the pressure building up in Jameis. The moment when it became too much for him to contain was as apparent to her as it was to Jameis or to Paul. Jameis leaped high, fainting and striking down with his right hand, but the hand was empty. The Chris knife had been shifted to his left hand. Jessica gasped, but Paul had been warned by Cheney. Jameis fights with either hand and the depth of his training had taken in that trick en passant. Keep the mind on the knife and not on the hand that holds it, Gurney Halleck had told him time and again. The knife is more dangerous than the hand, and the knife can be in either hand. And Paul had seen Jameis's mistake, bad footwork, so that it took the man a heartbeat longer to recover from his leap, which had been intended to confuse Paul and hide the knife shift. Except for the low yellow light of the glow globes and the inky eyes of the staring troop, it was similar to a session on the practice floor. Shields didn't count where the body's own movement could be used against it. Paul shifted his own knife in a blurred motion, slipped sideways and thrust upward where Jameis's chest was descending, then away to watch the man crumble. Jameis fell like a limp rag, face down, gasped once, and turned his face toward Paul, then lay still on the rock floor. His dead eyes stared out like beads of dark glass. Killing with the point lacks artistry, Idaho had once told Paul, but don't let that hold your hand when the opening presents itself. 
The troop rushed forward, filling the ring, pushing Paul aside. They hid Jameis in a frenzy of huddling activity. Presently, a group of them hurried back into the depths of the cavern, carrying a burden wrapped in a robe, and there was no body on the rock floor. From this incident, Paul gains a Fremen name, Muad'Dib. Paul Muad'Dib and his Fremen overcome the Emperor's Sardaukar forces and the Harkonnens. Now is the showdown with the Emperor, whose entourage includes Fade Routha Harkonnen, the man who was groomed to take the place of the old Baron, the family's traditional enemy. Fade Routha has demanded the right of combat with Paul. Is the Atreides ready? Fade Routha called using the words of the ancient Conley ritual. Paul chose to answer him in the Fremen way. May thy knife chip and shatter. He pointed to the Emperor's blade on the floor, indicating that Fade Routha should advance and take it. Keeping his attention on Paul, Fade Routha picked up the knife, balancing it a moment in his right hand to get the feel of it. Excitement kindled in him. This was a fight he had dreamed about. Man against man, skill against skill, with no shields intervening. He could see a way to power opening before him, because the Emperor surely would reward whoever killed this troublesome Duke. The reward might even be that haughty daughter and a share of the throne, and this yokel Duke, this backworld adventurer, could not possibly be a match for a Harkonnen trained in every device and every treachery by a thousand arena combats. And the yokel had no way of knowing he faced more weapons than a knife here. Let us see if you're proof against poison, Fade Routha thought. He saluted Paul with the Emperor's blade, said, Meet your death, fool. Shall we fight, cousin? Paul asked. And he cat-footed forward, eyes on the waiting blade, his body crouched low with his own milk-white criss knife pointing out as though an extension of his arm. They circled each other, bare feet grating on the floor, watching with eyes intent for the slightest opening. How beautifully you dance, Fade Rotha said. He's a talker, Paul thought. There's another weakness. He grows uneasy in the face of silence. Have you been shriven? Fade Rotha asked. Still, Paul circled in silence. And the old reverend mother, watching the fight from the press of the emperor's suite, felt herself trembling. The Atreides youth had called the Harkonnen cousin. It could only mean he knew the ancestry they shared, easy to understand, because he was the Kvisatz Haderach. But the words forced her to focus on the only thing that mattered to her here. This could be a major catastrophe for the Bene Gesserit breeding scheme. She had seen something of what Paul had seen here, that Fade Routha might kill but not be victorious. Another thought, though, almost overwhelmed her. Two end products of this long and costly program faced each other in a fight to the death that might easily claim both of them. If both died here, that would leave only Fade Routha's bastard daughter, still a baby, an unknown, an unmeasured factor, and Aaliyah, Paul's sister, the abomination. Perhaps you have only pagan rites here, Fade Routha said. Would you like the Emperor's truthsayer to prepare your spirit for its journey? Paul smiled, circling to the right, alert, his black thoughts suppressed by the needs of the moment. Fade Routha leaped, fainting with his right hand, but with the knife shifted in a blur to his left hand. Paul dodged easily, noting the shield conditioned hesitation in Fade Routha's thrust. Still, it was not as great a shield conditioning as some Paul had seen, and he sensed that Fade Routha had fought before against unshielded foes. Does an Atreides run or stand and fight? Fade Routha asked. Paul resumed his silent circling. Idaho's words came back to him, the words of training from the long ago practice floor on Caladan. Use the first moments in study. You may miss many an opportunity for quick victory this way, but the moments of study are insurance of success. Take your time and be sure. Perhaps you think this dance prolongs your life a few moments, Fade Routha said. Well and good. He stopped the circling, straightened. Paul had seen enough for a first approximation. Fade Routha led to the left side, presenting the right hip as though the mailed fighting girdle could protect his entire side.
It was the action of a man trained to the shield and with a knife in both hands. Or, and Paul hesitated, the girdle was more than it seemed. The Harkonnen appeared too confident against a man who this day led the forces of victory against Sardaukar legions. Fade Rautha noted the hesitation, said, Why prolong the inevitable? You but keep me from exercising my rights over this ball of dirt. If it's a flip dart, Paul thought, it's a cunning one. The girdle shows no sign of tampering. Why don't you speak? Fade Rautha demanded. Paul resumed his probing circle, allowing himself a cold smile at the tone of unease in Fade Rautha's voice, evidence that the pressure of silence was building. You smile, eh? Fade Rautha asked, and he leaped in mid-sentence. Expecting the slight hesitation, Paul almost failed to evade the downflash of blade, felt its tip scratch his left arm. He silenced the sudden pain there, his mind flooded with realization that the earlier hesitation had been a trick, an overfaint. Here was more of an opponent than he had expected. There would be tricks within tricks within tricks. Your own Thufir Hawit taught me some of my skills, Fade Rautha said. He gave me first blood. Too bad the old fool didn't live to see it. And Paul recalled that Idaho had once said, Expect only what happens in the fight. That way you'll never be surprised. Again the two circled each other, crouched, cautious. Paul saw the return of elation to his opponent, wondered at it. Did a scratch signify that much to the man? Unless there were poison on the blade. But how could there be? His own men had handled the weapon, snooped it before passing it. They were too well trained to miss an obvious thing like that. That woman you were talking to over there, Fade Rautha said, the little one, is she something special to you? A pet, perhaps? Will she deserve my special attentions? Paul remained silent, probing with his inner senses, examining the blood from the wound, finding a trace of soporific from the Emperor's blade. He realigned his own metabolism to match this threat, and changed the molecules of the soporific, but he felt a thrill of doubt. They'd been prepared with a soporific on a blade, a soporific, nothing to alert a poison snooper, but strong enough to slow the muscles it touched. His enemies had their own plans within plans, their own stacked treacheries. Again, Fade Rautha leaped, stabbing. Paul, the smile frozen on his face, fainted with slowness as though inhibited by the drug, and at the last instant dodged to meet the downflashing arm on the Chris knife's point. Fade Rautha ducked sideways and was out and away, his blade shifted to his left hand, and the measure of him, that only a slight paleness of jaw, betrayed the acid pain where Paul had cut him. Let him know his own moment of doubt, Paul thought. Let him suspect poison. Treachery, Fade Rautha shouted. He's poisoned me. I do feel poison in my arm. Paul dropped his cloak of silence, said, Only a little acid to counter the soporific on the emperor's blade. Fade Rautha matched Paul's cold smile, lifted blade in left hand for a mock salute. His eyes glared rage behind the knife. Paul shifted his Chris knife to his left hand, matching his opponent. Again they circled, probing. Fade Rautha began closing the space between them, edging in, knife held high, anger showing itself in a squint of eye, set of jaw. He fainted right and under, and they were pressed against each other, knife hands gripped, straining. Paul, cautious of Fade Rautha's right hip, where he suspected a poison flip dart, forced the turn to the right. He almost failed to see the needle point flick out beneath the belt line. A shift and a giving in Fade Rautha's motion warned him. The tiny point missed Paul's flesh by the barest fraction. On the left hip, treachery. Within treachery, within treachery, Paul reminded himself. Using Benny Jesserit trained muscles, he sagged to catch a reflex in Fade Rautha. But the necessity of avoiding the tiny point jutting from his opponent's hip threw Paul off just enough that he missed his footing and found himself thrown hard to the floor, Fade Rautha on top. You see it there on my hip, Fade Rautha whispered. You're death, fool. And he began twisting himself around, forcing the poisoned needle closer and closer. It'll stop your muscles, and my knife will finish you. There'll be never a trace left to detect. 
Paul strained, hearing the silent screams in his mind, his cell-stamped ancestors demanding that he use the secret word to slow Fade Routha to save himself. I will not say it, Paul gasped. Fade Routha gaped at him, caught in the merest fraction of hesitation. It was enough for Paul to find the weakness of balance in one of his opponent's leg muscles, and their positions were reversed. Fade Routha lay partly underneath with right hip high, unable to turn because of the tiny needle point caught against the floor beneath him. Paul twisted his left hand free, aided by the lubrication of blood from his arm, thrust once hard up underneath Fade Routha's jaw. The point slid home into the brain. Fade Routha jerked and sagged back, still held partly on his side by the needle embedded in the floor. Breathing deeply to restore his calm, Paul pushed himself away and got to his feet. He stood over the body, knife in hand, raised his eyes with deliberate slowness to look across the room at the Emperor. Majesty, Paul said, your force is reduced by one more. Shall we now shed sham and pretense? Shall we now discuss what must be? Your daughter wed to me, and the way opened for an Atreides to sit on the throne. For Paul Muad'Dib, victory turns sour. He has caught himself on a narrow track of prophecy. In doing this, he loses his beloved Cheney, his sense of honor, his eyesight, and almost loses his twin infants. Here you see him being led to the fateful moment by the dwarf Bijaz, the moment of his lost sight. First moon stood high over the city as Paul, his shield activated and shimmering around him, emerged from the cul-de-sac. A wind off the massif whirled sand and dust down the narrow street, causing Bijaz to blink and shield his eyes. We must hurry, the dwarf muttered. Hurry, hurry! You sense danger? Paul asked, probing. I know danger! An abrupt sense of peril very near was followed almost immediately by a figure joining them out of a doorway. Bijaz crouched and whimpered. It was only Stilgar, moving like a war machine, head thrust forward, feet striking the street solidly. Swiftly, Paul explained the value of the dwarf handed Bijaz over to Stilgar. The pace of the vision moved here with great rapidity. Stilgar sped away with Bijaz. Security guards enveloped Paul. Orders were given to send men down the street toward the house behind Othheims. The men hurried to obey, shadows among shadows. More sacrifices, Paul thought. We want live prisoners, one of the guard officers hissed. The sound was a vision echo in Paul's ears. It went with solid precision here, vision reality, tick for tick. Ornithopters drifted down across the moon. The night was full of Imperial troopers attacking. A soft hiss grew out of the other sounds, climbed to a roar. While they still heard the sibilance, it picked up a terracotta glow that hid the stars, engulfed the moon. Paul, knowing that sound and glow from the earliest nightmare glimpses of his vision, felt an odd sense of fulfillment. It went the way it must. Stone burner, someone screamed. Stone burner! The cry was all around him. Stone burner! Stone burner! Because it was required of him, Paul threw a protective arm across his face, dove for the low lip of a curb. It already was too late, of course. Where Othheim's house had been, there stood now a pillar of fire, a blinding jet roaring at the heavens. It gave off a dirty brilliance which threw into sharp relief every ballet movement of the fighting and fleeing men, the tipping retreat of ornithopters. For every member of this frantic throng, it was too late. The ground grew hot beneath Paul. He heard the sound of running stop. Men threw themselves down all around him, every one of them aware that there was no point in running. The first damage had been done, and now they must wait out the extent of the stone burner's potency. The thing's radiation, which no man could outrun, already had penetrated their flesh. The peculiar result of stone burner radiation already was at work in them. What else this weapon might do now lay in the planning of the men who had used it, the men who had defied the great convention to use it. God's a stone burner, someone whimpered. I don't want to be blind. Who does? The hoarse voice of a trooper far down the street. 
The Tleilaxu will sell many eyes here, someone near Paul growled. Now shut up and wait. They waited. Paul remained silent, thinking what this weapon implied. Too much fuel in it, and it had cut its way into the planet's core. Dune's molten level lay deep, but the more dangerous for that. Such pressures released and out of control might split a planet, scattering lifeless bits and pieces through space. I think it's dying down a bit, someone said. It's just digging deeper, Paul cautioned. Stay put, all of you. Stilgar will be sending help. Stilgar got away? Stilgar got away. The ground's hot, someone complained. They dared use atomics, a trooper near Paul protested. The sound's diminishing, someone down the street said. Paul ignored the words, concentrated on his fingertips against the street. He could feel the rolling rumble of the thing, deep, deep. My eyes, someone cried, I can't see. Someone closer to it than I was, Paul thought. He still could see to the end of the cul-de-sac when he lifted his head, although there was a mistiness across the scene. A red-yellow glow filled the area where Othheim's house and its neighbors had been. Pieces of adjoining buildings made dark patterns as they crumbled into the glowing pit. Paul climbed to his feet. He felt the stone burner die, silence beneath him. His body was wet with perspiration against the still suit's slickness. Too much for the suit to accommodate. The air he drew into his lungs carried the heat and sulfur stench of the burner. As he looked at the troopers beginning to stand up around him, the mist on Paul's eyes faded into darkness. He summoned up his oracular vision of these moments then, turned, and strode along the track that time had carved for him, fitting himself into the vision so tightly that it could not escape. He felt himself grow aware of this place as a multitudinous possession, reality welded to prediction. Moans and groans of his troopers arose all around him as the men realized their blindness. Hold fast, Paul shouted. Help is coming. And as the complaints persisted, he said, This is Muad'Dib. I command you. Hold fast. Help comes. Silence. Then, true to his vision, a nearby guardsman said, Is it truly the emperor? Which of you can see? Tell me. None of us has eyes, Paul said. They have taken my eyes as well, but not my vision. I can see you standing there, a dirty wall within touching distance on your left. Now wait bravely. Stilgar comes with our friends. The thwack thwack of many thopters grew louder all around. There was the sound of hurrying feet. Paul watched his friends come, matching their sounds to his oracular vision. Stilgar, Paul shouted, waving an arm. Over here. Thanks to Shai Hulud, Stilgar cried, running up to Paul. You're not... In the sudden silence, Paul's vision showed him Stilgar, staring with an expression of agony at the ruined eyes of his friend and emperor. Oh, my lord, Stilgar groaned. Usul, Usul, Usul. What of the stone burner? One of the newcomers shouted. It's ended, Paul said, raising his voice. He gestured, get up there now and rescue the ones who were closest to it. Put up barriers. Lively now. He turned back to Stilgar. Do you see, my lord? Stilgar asked. Wonder in his tone, how can you see? For answer, Paul put a finger out to touch Stilgar's cheek above the still suit's mouth cap, felt tears. You need give no moisture to me, old friend, Paul said. I am not dead. But your eyes! They've blinded my body, but not my vision, Paul said. Ah, still, I live in an apocalyptic dream. My steps fit into it so precisely that I fear most of all I will grow bored reliving the thing so exactly. Muad'Dib, indeed, has no eyes, but he sees all without them through the accuracy of his prophetic vision, demonstrating the narrow track of his future. His troopers will buy Tlilaxu eyes, but he will not. In the end, using the sight of his newborn son, Paul slays a traitor, but then walks into the desert, giving himself to Shai Hulud, as Fremen tradition demands. Now it is the time of Paul Muad'Dib's twin children, Leto II and Ganima. But Shaddam's descendants plot to regain the throne, and their plan includes the training of two tigers. The two big cats came over the rocky ridge in the dawnlight, loping easily. 
They were not really into the passionate hunt as yet, merely looking over their territory. They were called Lesa Tigers, a special breed brought here to the planet Seleucia Secundus almost 8,000 years past. Genetic manipulation of the ancient Terran stock had erased some of the original tiger features and refined other elements. The fangs remained long. Their faces were wide, eyes alert and intelligent. The paws were enlarged to give them support on uneven terrain, and their sheathed claws could extend some ten centimeters, sharpened at the ends into razor tips by abrasive compression of the sheath. Their coats were a flat and even tan, which made them almost invisible against sand. They differed in another way from their ancestors. Servo stimulators had been implanted in their brains while they were cubs. The stimulators made them pawns of whoever possessed the transmitter. It was cold, and as the cats paused to scan the terrain, their breath made fog on the air. Around them lay a region of Seleucus Secundus left sere and barren, a place which harbored a scant few sand trout smuggled from Arrakis and kept precariously alive in the dream that the Melange monopoly might be broken. Where the cats stood, the landscape was marked by tan rocks and a scattering of sparse bushes, silvery green in the long shadows of the morning sun. With only the slightest movement, the cats grew suddenly alert. Their eyes turned slowly left, then their heads turned. Far down in the scarred land, two children struggled up a dry wash, hand in hand. The children appeared to be of an age, perhaps nine or ten standard years, they were red-haired and wore still suits partly covered by rich white burkas, which bore all around the hem and at the forehead the hawk crest of the house Atreides, worked in flame jewel threads. As they walked, the children chattered happily, and their voices carried clearly to the hunting cats. The laser tigers knew this game, they had played it before, but they remained quiescent, awaiting the triggering of the chase signal in their servo stimulators. Now a man appeared on the ridge top behind the cats. He stopped and surveyed the scene. Cats, children. The man wore a Sardaukar working uniform in gray and black with insignia of a Levenbreck aid to a Bashar. A harness passed behind his neck and under his arms to carry the servo transmitter in a thin package against his chest where the keys could be reached easily by either hand. The cats did not turn at his approach. They knew this man by sound and smell. He scrambled down to stop two paces from the cats, mopped his forehead. The air was cold, but this was hot work. Again his pale eyes surveyed the scene, cats, children. He pushed a damp strand of blonde hair back under his black working helmet, touched the implanted microphone in his throat. The cats have them in sight. The answering voice came to him through receivers implanted behind each ear. We see them. This time, the Levenbreck asked, Will they do it without a chase command, the voice countered. They're ready, the Levenbreck said. Very well. Let us see if four conditioning sessions will be enough. Tell me when you're ready. Any time. Now then, the Levenbreck said. He touched a red key on the right-hand side of his servo transmitter, first releasing a bar which shielded the key. Now the cats stood without any transmitted restraints, he held his hand over a black key below the red one, ready to stop the animals should they turn on him. But they took no notice of him, crouched, and began working their way down the ridge toward the children. Their great paws slid out in smooth, gliding motions. The Levenbreck squatted to observe, knowing that somewhere around him a hidden transi carried this entire scene to a secret monitor within the keep where his prince lived. Presently the cats began to lope, then to run, the children, intent on climbing through the rocky terrain, still had not seen their peril. One of them laughed a high and piping sound in the clear air. The other child stumbled and, recovering balance, turned and saw the cats. The child pointed. Look! Both children stopped and stared at the interesting intrusion into their lives. They were still standing when the laser tigers hit them, one cat to each child. The children died with a casual abruptness, necks broken swiftly. The cats began to feed. Shall I recall them? the Levenbreck asked. Let them finish. They did well. I knew they would. This pair is superb. Best I've ever seen, the Levenbreck agreed. Very good, then. Transport is being sent for you. We will sign off now. 
The Levenbreck stood and stretched. He refrained from looking directly off to the high ground on his left, where a telltale glitter had revealed the location of the transi which had relayed his fine performance to his bashar, far away in the green lands of the capital. The Levenbreck smiled. There would be a promotion for this day's work. Already he could feel a bator's insignia at his neck, and some day, Berseg, even one day Bashar. People who served well in the corps of Faradin, grandson of the late Shaddam IV, earned rich promotions. One day, when the prince was seated on his rightful throne, there would be even greater promotions. A Bashar's rank might not be the end of it. There were baronies and earldoms to be had on the many worlds of this realm. Once the twin Atreides were removed. Alia, the sister of Paul Moadib, now rules on Dune, but because of spice addiction before birth, she has succumbed to possession by an ancestor, the old and evil Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, the man she killed while she was still a child. Under the influence of this possession, Alia plots the murder of her own mother, the Lady Jessica, and, when that fails, gloats over the fact that the sandworms are doomed, that spice production will fail. Having identified Al-Fali, one of Paul's old Fedaikan guards in the throng below her, Jessica stands in the audience hall, thinking. Alia lied because she was possessed by one who would destroy the Atreides. She was in herself the first destruction. Then Al-Fali spoke the truth. The sandworms are doomed unless the course of the ecological transformation is modified. In the pressure of revelation, Jessica saw the people of the audience reduced to slow motion, their roles identified for her. She could pick the ones charged with seeing that she did not leave here alive, and the path through them lay there in her awareness as though outlined in bright light, confusion among them. One of them fainted to stumble into another, whole groups tangled. She saw also that she might leave this great hall only to fall into other hands. Aaliyah did not care if she created a martyr. No, the thing which possessed her did not care. Now in this frozen time, Jessica chose a way to save the old naive Al-Fali and send him as messenger. The way through the audience remained indelibly clear. How simple it was. They were buffoons with barricaded eyes, their shoulders held in positions of immovable defense. Each position upon the great floor could be seen as an atropic collision from which dead flesh might slow away to reveal skeletons. Their bodies, their clothes, and their faces described individual hells, the insucked breast of concealed terrors, the glittering hook of a jewel become substitute armor, the mouths were judgments full of frightened absolutes, cathedral prisms of eyebrows showing lofty and religious sentiments which their loins denied. Jessica sensed dissolution in the shaping forces loosed upon Arrakis. Al-Fali's voice had been like a distrans of her soul, awakening a beast from the deepest part of her. In an eye blink, Jessica moved from the Adab into the universe of movement, but it was a different universe from the one which had commanded her attention only a second before. Aaliyah was starting to speak, but Jessica said, Silence! Then... There are those who fear that I have returned without reservation to the sisterhood. But since that day in the desert when the Fremen gave the gift of life to me and to my son, I have been Fremen. And she lapsed into the old tongue which only those in this room who could profit by it would understand. Onsar, Achaka, Seliman, or Masluman. Support your brother in his time of need, whether he be just or unjust. Her words had the desired effect, a subtle shifting of positions within the chamber. But Jessica raged on. This Gadheen Al-Fali, an honest Fremen, comes here to tell me what others should have revealed to me. Let no one deny this. The ecological transformation has become a tempest out of control. Wordless confirmations could be seen throughout the room. And my daughter delights in this, Jessica said. Mektub al-Malah. You carve wounds upon my flesh and write their insult. Why did the Atreides find a home here? Because the Mohalata was natural to us. To the Atreides, government was always a protective partnership, Mohalata, as the Fremen have always known it. Now look at her, 
Jessica pointed at Aaliyah. She laughs alone at night in contemplation of her own evil. Spice production will fall to nothing, or at best a fraction of its former level. And when word of that gets out, we'll have a corner on the most priceless product in the universe, Aaliyah said. We'll have a corner on hell, Jessica raged. And Aaliyah lapsed into the most ancient Chakobsa, the Atreides' private language, with its difficult glottal stops and clicks. Now you know, mother. Did you think a granddaughter of Baron Harkonnen would not appreciate all of the lifetimes you crushed into my awareness before I was even born? When I raged against what you'd done to me, I had only to ask myself what the Baron would have done. And he answered. Understand me, Atreides, bitch. He answered me. Jessica heard the venom and the confirmation of her guess. Abomination. Aaliyah had been overwhelmed within. Possessed by that kahuit of evil, the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. The Baron himself spoke from her mouth now, uncaring of what was revealed. He wanted her to see his revenge, wanted her to know that he could not be cast out. I'm supposed to remain here, helpless in my knowledge, Jessica thought. With the thought, she launched herself onto the path the Adab had revealed, shouting, Fedaikin, follow me! It turned out... There were six Fidaikin in the room, and five of them one threw behind her. Ganima and Leto escape the Lesa tigers, and Leto, captive in the desert, forms a symbiotic bond with a vector of the giant sandworms. In time, he knows he will lose his humanity and become something like the mindless worm, but meanwhile he has enormous strength. At C.H. Taber, where Ganima is being held, the restored Gola, Duncan Idaho, has tried to talk Stilgar into fleeing with Ganima. Aaliyah wants her revenge on the twins. For reasons of Fremen honor, Stilgar refuses. But Idaho knows this is Ganima's only safety. Idaho and Stilgar are being watched by Javid, a spy from those who held Leto. He cannot be that naive, Idaho thought. But Stilgar was rising to indicate that the interview was ended. Idaho levered himself to his feet, feeling the stiffness in his knees. His calves felt numb. As Idaho stood, an aide entered and stood aside. Javid came into the room behind him. Idaho turned. Stilgar stood four paces away. Without hesitating, Idaho drew his knife in one swift motion and drove its point into the breast of the unsuspecting Javid. The man staggered backward, pulling himself off the knife. He turned, fell onto his face. His legs kicked, and he was dead. That was to silence the gossip, Idaho said. The aide stood with drawn knife, undecided how to react. Idaho had already sheathed his own knife, leaving a trace of blood on the edge of his yellow robe. You have defiled my honor, Stilgar cried. This is neutral. Shut up, Idaho glared at the shocked Naib. You wear a collar, Stilgar. It was one of the three most deadly insults which could be directed at a Fremen. Stilgar's face went pale. You are a servant, Idaho said. You've sold Fremen for their water. This was the second most deadly insult, the one which had destroyed the original Jakarutu. Stilgar ground his teeth, put a hand on his chris knife. The aide stepped back away from the body in the doorway. Turning his back on the naib, Idaho stepped into the door, taking the narrow opening beside Javid's body and speaking without turning, delivered the third insult. You have no immortality, Stilgar. None of your descendants carry your blood. Where do you go now, Mentat? Stilgar called as Idaho continued leaving the room. Stilgar's voice was as cold as a wind from the poles. To find Jakarutu, Idaho said, still not turning. Stilgar drew his knife. Perhaps I can help you. Idaho was at the outer lip of the passage now. Without stopping, he said... If you'd help me with your knife, water thief, please do it in my back. That's the fitting way for one who wears the collar of a demon. With two leaping strides, Stilgar crossed the room, stepped on Javid's body, and caught Idaho in the outer passage. One gnarled hand jerked Idaho around and to a stop. Stilgar confronted Idaho with bared teeth and a drawn knife. Such was his rage that Stilgar did not even see the curious smile on Idaho's face. Draw your knife, mentat scum, Stilgar roared. Idaho laughed. He cuffed Stilgar sharply, left hand, right hand, two stinging slaps to the head. 
With an incoherent screech, Stilgard drove his knife into Idaho's abdomen, striking upward through the diaphragm into the heart. Idaho sagged onto the blade, grinned up at Stilgar, whose rage dissolved into sudden icy shock. Two deaths for the Atreides, Idaho husked. The second for no better reason than the first. He lurched sideways, collapsed to the stone floor on his face. Blood spread out from his wound. Stilgar stared down past his dripping knife at the body of Idaho, took a deep, trembling breath. Javid lay dead behind him, and the consort of Aaliyah, the womb of heaven, lay dead at Stilgar's own hands. It might be argued that a naive had but protected the honor of his name, avenging the threat to his promised neutrality. But this dead man was Duncan Idaho. No matter the arguments available, no matter the extenuating circumstances, nothing could erase such an act. Even were Aaliyah to approve privately, she would be forced to respond publicly in revenge. She was, after all, Fremen. To rule Fremen, she could be nothing else, not even to the smallest degree. Only then did it occur to Stilgar that this situation was precisely what Idaho had intended to buy with his second death. Stilgar looked up, saw the shocked face of Hara, his second wife, peering at him in an enclosing throng. Everywhere Stilgar turned, there were faces with identical expressions, shock, and an understanding of the consequences. Slowly, Stilgar drew himself erect, wiped the blade on his sleeve, and sheathed it. Speaking to the faces, his tone casual, he said, Those who will go with me should pack at once. Send men to summon worms. Where will you go, Stilgar? Hara asked. Into the desert. I will go with you, she said. Of course you'll go with me. All of my wives will go with me. And Ganima, get her, Hara, at once. Yes, Stilgar, at once. She hesitated. And Irulan? If she wishes. Yes, husband. Still she hesitated. You take Gani as hostage? Hostage? He was genuinely startled at the thought. Woman? He touched Idaho's body softly with a toe. If this Mentat was right, I'm Gani's only hope. And he remembered then Leto's warning. Beware of Aaliyah. You must take Gani and flee. In the end, Leto confronts his Aunt Aaliyah with her evil possession. Present are Ganima, Jessica, Faradin, the former emperor's heir, and their aides. Leto is armed only with his new symbiotic skin, which will, one day, turn him into a sandworm. Aaliyah screamed at her guards, cowering in the passage, I command you to seize them! But the guards refused to enter the room. Wait for me here, sister, Leto said. I have a disagreeable task to perform. He moved across the room toward Aaliyah. She backed away from him into a corner, crouched and drew her knife. The green jewels of its handle flashed in the light from the window. Leto merely continued his advance, hands empty but spread and ready. Aaliyah lunged with the knife. Leto leaped almost to the ceiling, struck with his left foot. It caught Aaliyah's head a glancing blow and sent her sprawling with a bloody mark on her forehead. She lost her grip on the knife and it skidded across the floor. Aaliyah scrambled after the knife but found Leto standing in front of her. Aaliyah hesitated, called up everything she knew of Benny Jess training. She came off the floor, body loose and poised. Once more, Leto advanced upon her. Aaliyah fainted to the left, but her right shoulder came up, and her right foot shot out in a toe-pointing kick, which would disembowel a man if it struck precisely. Leto caught the blow on his arm, grabbed the foot, and picked her up by it, swinging her around his head. The speed with which he swung her sent a flapping, hissing sound through the room as her robe beat against her body. The others ducked away. Aaliyah screamed and screamed, but still she continued to swing around and around and around. Presently she fell silent. Slowly, Leto reduced the speed of her whirling, dropped her gently to the floor. She lay in a panting bundle. Leto bent over her. I could have thrown you through a wall, he said. Perhaps that would have been best. But we are now at the center of the struggle. You deserve your chance. Aaliyah's eyes darted wildly from side to side. I have conquered those inner lives, Leto said. Look at Gani. She too can, Ganima interrupted. Aaliyah, I can show you. No! The word was wrenched from Aaliyah. Her chest heaved and voices began to pour from her mouth. They were disconnected, cursing, pleading. 
You see? Why didn't you listen? And again, What are you doing this? What's happening? And another voice, Stop them! Make them stop! Jessica covered her eyes, felt Faradun's hand steady her. Still, Aaliyah raved. I'll kill you! Hideous curses erupt from her. I'll drink your blood! The sounds of many languages began to pour from her, all jumbled and confused. The huddled guards in the outer passage made the sign of the worm, then held clenched fists beside their ears. She was possessed. Leto stood, shaking his head. He stepped to the window, and with three swift blows, shattered the supposedly unbreakable crystal-reinforced glass from its frame. A sly look came over Aaliyah's face. Jessica heard something like her own voice come from the twisting mouth, a parody of Bene Gesserit control. All of you, stay where you are. Jessica lowered her hands, found them damp with tears. Aaliyah rolled to her knees, lurched to her feet. Don't you know who I am, she demanded. It was her old voice, the sweet and lilting voice of the youthful Aaliyah, who was no more. Why are you all looking at me that way? She turned pleading eyes to Jessica. Mother, make them stop it. Jessica could only shake her head from side to side, consumed by ultimate horror. All of the old Bene Gesserit warnings were true. She looked at Leto and Ghani, standing side by side near Aaliyah. What did those warnings mean for these poor twins? Grandmother, Leto said, and there was pleading in his voice, must we have a trial of possession? Who are you to speak of trial? Aaliyah asked, and her voice was that of a querulous man, an autocratic and sensual man far gone in self-indulgence. Both Leto and Ganima recognized the voice, the old Baron Harkonnen. Ganima heard the same voice begin to echo in her own head, but the inner gate closed, and she sensed her mother standing there. Jessica remained silent. Then the decision is mine, Leto said, and the choice is yours, Aaliyah. Trial of possession... Or, he nodded toward the open window. Who are you to give me a choice? Aaliyah demanded, and it was still the voice of the old baron. Demon, Ganima screamed. Let her make her own choice. Mother, Aaliyah pleaded in her little girl tones. Mother, what are they doing? What do you want me to do? Help me. Help yourself, Leto ordered, and for just an instant he saw the shattered presence of his aunt in her eyes, a glaring hopelessness which peered out at him and was gone. But her body moved, a stick-like thrusting walk. She wavered, stumbled, veered from her path, but returned to it, nearer and nearer the open window. Now the voice of the old baron raged from her lips, Stop! Stop it, I say! I command you! Stop it! Feel this! Aaliyah clutched her head, stumbled closer to the window. She had the sill against her thighs then, but the voice still raved. Don't do this! Stop it and I'll help you! I have a plan! Listen to me! Stop it, I say! Wait! But Aaliyah pulled her hands away from her head, clutched the broken casement. In one jerking motion, she pulled herself over the sill and was gone. Not even a screech came from her as she fell. In the room they heard the crowd shout, the sudden thump as Aaliyah struck the steps far below. Leto looked at Jessica. We told you to pity her. <laughs>